unapologetically fly. No wonder why, that's just my attitude. Yeah. Okay, hey, that's just my. Uh, 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 come on. Yeah, yeah. Hi guys, welcome to Iconic.com. Here is Glitch in the Code. I'm here with author Mark McDonald um, of the United States of Fear. I've got his book here. And most people will be talking about basically what he's written about here. Obviously, Mark Malone was talking about the mass formation psychosis. I know you used a different term from that, but you're one of the guys that he got this kind of terminology from. It's been around for a long time, this kind of way of thinking. But I think it's a great thing for people to start talking about because people can't understand why people are acting so strange and so mad right now. And to so people that can see it, it's so obvious. Obviously, a lot of cognitive dissonance going on, people purposely not wanting to see it. But your book really does point out why they were behaving this way. So since Mark Malone started um, uh, talking about this, you must have been inundated with people to speak to and people to kind of refresh and kind of dig down into really what this is. It must have gone mad. Yeah, Dr. Robert Malone. Rob, Mark Malone. I've, I've got a friend of mine called Mark. <laughs> I've got a friend called Mark Malone, which I've just done a podcast with yesterday. Really? So it's Robert Malone. Oh, so you've got yeah. that name in your head. I've just friend. basically melded mailed all the people together. Sorry. So Dr. Well, Robert Malone. Well, it's actually uh, apropos because that's exactly what Dr. Robert Malone did with the expressions, plural, mass delusional psychosis, which is my, my expression, which I began speaking about in summer of 2020. So nearly two years ago now. And Dr. Matthias Desmet, Belgian psychologist expression, which he coined as mass formation years and years ago, using the word formation as a synonym for psychosis. So we can call that mass psychosis. And then mine is mass delusional psychosis. Desmet and I basically mean the same thing. We're coming at it from different angles. We don't know each other. I didn't even hear, know his name until probably November of this past year. So we're working independently. But Dr. Robert Malone, he spliced the two terms together and came up with and mass formation psychosis is just a neolog psychosis psychosis. He he doesn't understand the distinction because he's not a psychiatrist. He's a he's a bench scientist and researcher and and, and publisher. Uh, and unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, because you know, all good publicity is, is, is all publicity is good publicity. On Joe Rogan, he used that expression and it just took off. And so now people are quoting that mass formation psychosis all over the world, even though it's, it's not really a real term, it's just sort of an invention. And it's a little bit confusing and unclear, but the idea behind it is what's important. And the idea, Desmet and my ideas are very similar, which is that there has been a worldwide societal acute, sudden loss of rationality in the pursuit of a, clinically speaking, a delusion, which is a fixed false belief contrary to reality. An example of that would be, if I drive in a car by myself, I need to wear a mask to stay safe. That's a delusion. That's, that's not being overprotected. That's not being emotional. That is a mental, that is a trait of a mental illness. It's a sign of something gone awry in the code, a, a glitch in the head really is what's going on. And that can be parsed out in many, many different ways through the idea that I'm going to stay home and isolate myself and keep myself from being in contact with the environment, from exercising, from getting sunlight, and that's going to make me more healthy. That's a delusion. That's a psychotic reaction. The idea that children should be forced to wear N95 masks indoors and outdoors as they are now at the Los Angeles Unified School District, the public school district where I live and work in Los Angeles, in order to keep them and their teachers safe, that's delusional, uh, that's psychotic. You know, that we, we all have countless examples of this that we've seen in our own lives and also that we've read about from our governments respectively throughout the world. And I believe it is a, a symptom of a loss of rationality on the part of the people. And you know, further, as I describe in my book, United States of Fear, there's another angle to this, which is equally, if not more important, which is the government themselves, the bureaucrats, the politicians, in many cases know that this is psychotic, that this is ill, that this is destructive, and yet they're pursuing it anyway. So there's another group of people who are not in the psychotic realm, they're actually in the narcissistic and sociopathic area, which I would call, say, Anthony Fauci is one of those people. He's not crazy. He is a cold-blooded killer, and he is knowingly 
uh, extinguished the lives of millions of people in the last 30 years, hundreds of thousands in the last two years, uh, as well as all of his sadistic experiments on dogs, which we, we now know about from press releases that he's been doing for years. And he did this knowingly. Uh, he's not an idiot. Uh, he has aggrandized his power and money and status uh, on the backs and over the blood of these animals and these, these millions of human beings, and he couldn't care less. That's not psychosis. That's not delusion. That is sociopathy. So I want to distinguish that because I think there's different groups that we have to keep in mind. Uh, one is the people, the people who are, who are sick in terms of their illness with psychosis, and then there's the people who are running this show who are sick in a different way. They're sick because they lack a conscience. It, it just sounds like a, like a, a macro version of a, of a an abusive relationship when the person <laughs> who's in the abuser abuses the person and obviously they become sick within it. And it, it really seems like like that. Yeah. Does this have any kind of correlation with things like OCD? Did they pick a, a, a kind of um, a medical issue to kind of use here? Because it seems to have the same delusions as someone who's got extreme OCD. I've suffered from extreme rituals and OCD myself, and you yeah. know you're deluded and you know that it doesn't make a difference. You just have to do it just in case. Is there a kind of feeling a, a well, there, crossover there, there? There is actually, you're making a very good point. A lot of the perpetuation of what I call the rituals, uh, the mask wearing, uh, the hand washing, uh, the stepping away from people to measure six feet apart, that is an expression of an obsessive compulsive disorder. If you know, part of you anyway, knows that it's not actually necessary or helpful. What we call ego dystonic, meaning there's a conflict between what you know to be the case and what you feel compelled to do. And people who have OCD, they generally recognize that what they're doing is unhealthy and unnecessary, but they can't stop. The difference between that and what we've been seeing in the last two years is by and large, people actually believed that their obsessive compulsive actions and behaviors, they actually believed that those were necessary in order to protect them and to protect others. And even more so, they would attack other people for not performing them. Somebody who has OCD doesn't go after other people for not being OCD. A Jew doesn't go after Gentiles for eating bacon. I've never seen it happen. They couldn't care less what you eat. This is about them. OCD is about you. This problem that we've been seeing, this mass delusional psychosis, it's not about just me, it's about everyone around me. That's how we got the Karens, the women, mostly white, liberal, single women in urban areas throughout the United States, rushing madly with crazed eyes, like you know, Sandy Cortez eyes, screaming at people for not wearing a mask. I mean, witness what happened in the elevator in New York City last week with these two middle-aged white women wearing masks, physically attacking a black man for not wearing a mask, all the while screaming at him yelling black lives matter, black lives matter. Now that is psychotic. And if you saw their eyes, they looked crazed. They looked psychotic. They looked like someone that you would see in a locked ward of a psych unit where I used to do my residency training when I was uh, in medical school. That is insanity. And that is very, very different from the obsessive compulsive disorder, even on a, a massive scale, certainly not on the mild scale that you, you know, personally have experienced in your own life. What's fascinating about that is because in the UK, they've just in the NHS, they've just dropped the mandates, which we, we thought they would do. But what they've actually done is they've passed the buck down the line from the government to the local kind of, I suppose you call them authorities. Uh, um, mm. But they're still going to probably implement them. Is there an element of we're going to implement this because we've, we've done all these things and we can't face the fact that we were wrong? Is there a doubling down? And that in itself is not a psychosis. They know they're doing wrong, but they, they can't let it go to, to look at themselves and what the behavior that they've actually portrayed for the last um, two years. They're going to have to look at the fact that they've actually gone along with these quite horrific things and done them to members of their own staff. Is there a psychotic break there? A ball? Do you know what's going on there? And how clever is it for the government to go, we're going to no longer mandate it, but we know you guys are going to just go along with it, almost like we've trained you into this way of thinking for two years and off you go. Well, you may be giving them a little bit too much credit, but let's start from there and, and, and work to the less credit position. Um, you're giving them the credit that they just simply psychologically, emotionally can't face the fact that they've been abusing the people for the last two years. And so they want to pass the buck. Uh, in the same way that, say, a mother uh, is not able to admit that she's been abusing her child by forcing him to wear a mask to go to school for two years. She has been. Uh, and I'm not saying that as a judgment. I'm saying that as a statement of fact. Uh, any parent that has been forcing their children to wear masks to go to school 
uh, for long periods of time. I'm not talking about to go grab something in the store because you need food to feed your family. I'm talking about really honestly going along with the program that your kid is wearing a mask eight hours a day. You have been abusing your child and you need to own up to it. Uh, my new book that I'm writing now, which is going to be tentatively titled Freedom from Fear, not United States of Fear, but Freedom from Fear, a 12-step program to a individual and national recovery modeled after the AA Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step program and Jordan B. Peterson's 12 Rules for Life is, is organized over the, the, I wouldn't even call it a metaphor, I think it's an actuality, that fear has become an addiction. And we need to treat this process now as an addiction. So just as an addict doesn't want to admit that he's an addict, much less that he's harmed himself and others, as we all know who have been in AA or know people who have been through AA or other 12-step programs, one of the critical steps beyond acknowledging that you're an addict is acknowledging the wrongs that you've caused others and asking for forgiveness and trying to right those wrongs to make up for that. If you can't do that, if you refuse to do that, you cannot be sober or abstinent. You can't be in recovery and still be refusing to acknowledge the harm. So if you wanna give some credit to the government, maybe they don't deserve it. If they're addicts, they're fear addicts, <clears throat> they cannot give this up. They cannot give up the um, addiction to making people scared. And maybe they have admitted that they've done it. They admitted that they're addicted and they made people addicted, but they haven't been able to admit that they've harmed people. So they're, they're not able to follow those steps. Now, if we take away that credit and we assume that they knew all along what they were doing, not that it was a mistake that they later found out about, <clears throat> and I think that's quite possible. Then we're looking at more of a fascistic takeover of the republic in the US or the, uh, the, the nation of Great Britain and uh, certainly Australia, certainly Western Europe, uh, Canada's already lost, New Zealand is lost. And what I mean by that <clears throat> is the cultural war in the United States and, and throughout most of Western Europe has really been one of um, a war uh, with communism, with a, a government takeover of uh, our lives on a cultural and economic level. And I still believe it's ongoing, certainly in the United States, and I believe in other, certainly um, other Anglophone countries. But what I noticed uh, just recently in the last couple of years, which I did not expect, is that there's been a superseding layer of fascism that's, that's uh, layered on top of the communism. <clears throat> and what I mean by that is that the government now, just to focus on the US for a moment, has not nationalized industry. They haven't taken over Amazon, for example and said, we're gonna own Amazon, we're gonna employ you, we're gonna determine your wages as, as Amazon employees. Um, but what they have done is they've issued regulations, mandates and, and semi-laws that are unconstitutional and probably illegal to block competition from other businesses, especially small businesses that are family owned that have been around for generations in many cases, so that Amazon can then succeed to monopolize the entire business community and industry in the United States without any competition. So they've tipped the scales, they've, they've cleared the road, they've changed the rules of the game so that one player, Amazon, will win all the spoils. Extrapolate that out to every industry in the United States, including media, including pharmacies, research, development, uh, medicine, large hospital chains versus small clinics, and now what you have is not a government that's control, controlling all of the economy. It's a government that's working hand in glove with private industry to support one another. And of course, those politicians will get reelected when they get con uh, com campaign contributions from those businesses that they help support. And I suspect that, that this is really what's driving all of the corruption. It's not mistakes. It's not errors. It's not overreach. It's the knowledge of government that without going to the nationalizing communist path, they can maintain the sense of a democracy, republic, a capitalist system, but they're cheating the system, they're cheating the people by redirecting all of the capitalist gains into one small concentrated family of individuals who are becoming multi-billionaires at the expense of a true equality of distribution of proceeds across the population. I think that's more nefarious and I think that that needs to be called out, otherwise, uh, we will really, as a people, will lose our capacity to maintain our independence as productive citizens. And you can see that that's quite clear. Most of this has been run from the World Economic Forum. 
Um, it obviously, and off the back of that, behind that is the, the, the great transition from the Rockefellers that not many people talk about either. Mm-hmm. Um, but these people, if you look anywhere, you'll see a Pfizer executive somewhere in, in one of these companies and have either switched. We know people have gone from Google to Apple to to Facebook and they switch around. It's the same people. The young global leaders include Macron. They include Jacinda Adhern. They include Blair was a part of it at one point. Even Leonardo mm-hmm. DiCaprio was part of it and pushing that sort of climate change agenda in, in films at the moment. This is a worldwide almost cult. Would you say it has a cult-like feel to it? Yes. I think cult is a very good word. Um, a cult is a group of people who acknowledge obeisance devotion to a guru who does not really have their best interests at heart and you could say gurus in this case plural and the cult followers of course the people the gurus are the politicians bureaucrats media conglomerates Um, they're all individuals i'm not blaming a corporation a corporation is 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 a representation of a person or a group of people it doesn't exist independently there's people behind corporations i'm just using that term loosely but those, those people have become the gurus, uh, and they're all, of course, following the same plan to um, take advantage of their acolytes. Uh, you know, gurus have traditionally severed ties uh, from their followers, between their followers and their family. They've taken all their money, they've shaved their heads, they forced them all to wear the same clothes, uh, and then they've taken advantage of the women sexually, and they've run away with the money. That's what a guru does. Uh, and that's kind of what the... Um, the cabal has done as well. Uh, They have groomed the populations around the world to be comfortable with living in a state of extended chronic fear, uh, anxiety, uh, as as, uh, Matthias Desmet said, uh, a state of of chronic, um, untethered, free-floating anxiety. And when you feel fearful and anxious, you naturally look towards someone who will say, I'll keep you safe. Um, All you have to do is sleep with me, give me your money, shave your head, wear these clothes, cut off ties from your family, attack anyone that even challenges or questions my authority uh, to prove that you are loyal to me. And then I promise you, I promise you, you will be shipped straight up to heaven or to the special celestial planet or the the spaceship. I guarantee that will happen for you. Thank goodness you're there for me, Mr. Guru. I really appreciate that. Of course, I'll give you everything. That's essentially what's happened. And because of the grooming process of fear that's been going on for so long, economic collapse, ecological collapse, and 12 years are gonna be in the the toilet, we're gonna be in the ocean, Uh, systemic racism, rape culture, toxic masculinity, Donald Trump, you name it, everybody was just already (gasps) vibrating so that when the virus showed up, the government said, wow, we're all gonna die. And then the population said, no, 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 please, what can we do to keep ourselves from dying? Well, I think I got an idea here. You're gonna stay home from work, you're going to give up all of your economy, your, your, your money earning capacity, your children, your education, your physical safety. Um, and in exchange, we'll give you some drugs, some give you alcohol and pot as much as you want, deliver it to your house, suspending all the regular protocols. We'll give you checks in the mail. Uh, we'll violate all of the educational codes. We'll, we'll graduate everybody. So don't worry about that. Um, and when we'll give you access to, to a bunch of shots that are going to save your life, but you just have to take them every few months because they don't really work that well. But if you, if you take them all the time, they work really well, but then they don't really work because you still have to wear a mask. And eventually people just said, yeah, sure, this sounds great. And they, and they just kept it up. And, and so now here we are two years later with now that the, ironically, those who keep advocating for income inequality being the greatest evil are the ones that have forcibly, not, not through choice, voluntary capacity, forcibly affected the greatest redistribution of wealth and, and ensconced income inequality in human history in under, in under 18 months, along with all the other garbage, the filthy masks and syringes and junk lying around in the oceans and the floor. They made the, the, the whole, the whole uh, ecoscape has been trashed. Uh, people's health has been destroyed. Suicides are going up, drug addiction. All of the problems that the so-called conservatives, the right wing, the fascists, the Donald Trump supporters, all, supposedly all the stuff that they wanted has now been actually bestowed on us by those very same people that attacked the sort of right-wing extremists two, two to four years ago. It's, it's an amazing irony and a flip and a control of language, which is you know, ultimately a communist um, way of doing things, controlling language in a way that I have never seen in my lifetime. It goes far beyond what was even performed by the greatest regimes in, in China, Soviet Union, and, and, and even you know, in Germany in the 20th century. 
there's a satanic inversion for to it isn't it there's a satanic flip to it what you pointed out yeah. out there was this um point where people would be like in a cult the cult thing really really resonates with me in the sense of people have said okay they're going to take this experimental jab they know people are getting ill from it they don't know the, the long-term effects of it but what they've convinced people to do is say okay as long as my health i can roll the dice on my health i can play russian roulette with my health as long as i'm not hurting anyone else for the greater good so what they've done is basically said people have lowered their own okay if i die from it as long as i'm not hurting anyone else that sounds like cult like thinking to me it's, it's i just insane. had a patient came by yesterday in his mid-20s nice guy kind of anxious having trouble with relationships a bit you know socially awkward and he acknowledged to me that recently he got his booster shot this is this will be his third shot and i just you know out of curiosity i just said i'm just wondering why you made that decision well, you know, I wasn't going to do it because I don't need it. I, I'm totally fine. I know I'm not going to get sick and die. I said, well, but that's good. That's, that sounds like you're rational. You're thinking properly. But I live with my grandparents, so I did it for them. And I was just stunned. I, I didn't even know what to say. I didn't even know where to begin with the counter argument that what he had done was actually not only hurting himself, putting himself at risk, but he was actually not only not helping his grandparents, he's probably actually harming them because all of the data out of the UK and now out of the US as well has shown that those who have received these multiple injections are more at risk, more likely to contract disease and more likely to develop asymptomatic high viral loads, which then spread to the people around them who are not protected. And I don't think that the vaccines protect people. I'm not saying that, but that's what their mindset is. Mm -hmm. So he's actually putting himself and his grandparents at risk believing, believing that he's protecting them. That, that is the, the, the perverse twist of all of this. It's not just an exaggeration, miscalculation. It is a inversion. It's, it's terrifying, isn't it, to see people go there. And, he'll, and as we come back to what we were talking about earlier, he will know that, but he's doing what he thinks is the great of good, but knowing that it's not the great of good. And that must have almost like a split in your mind like a cognitive split to go okay i'm doing the opposite of what i said i'm doing but i'm doing it for the outcome that i've been told is the best knowing that it's not all of this is going on there in their head and they're going the fear i suppose the fear isn't no longer are you going to die the fear is really i'm the fear am i going to kill someone else that's the the transition point that makes it very hard to fight back against this uh, as long as it's we're accountable for ourselves. It really is a question of personal choice ultimately. But when you're now you're accountable for everyone else in the same way that say, if you use plastic trash bags, you're accountable for the, the sludge that shows up from China. Or if you use a standard incandescent light bulb, you're responsible for the deaths of children in Africa because you didn't switch over to a subcompact you know, UV light. Now suddenly, we don't have the options to just say, waste our money on inefficient lighting or use more plastic bags than we'd like to and then pay the cost at the supermarket or, or paying more for our garbage. We're not bearing those costs. The world is bearing our choices. What an awful and moral thing for us to do. We don't have the right to inflict that toll on other people, do we? And you just keep taking that further and further until now, what would have been three years ago considered an unassailable basic human and certainly constitutional right, which is bodily integrity. I mean, we've been hearing since Roe versus Wade, my body, my choice, even though the baby inside the woman is not her body, it's actually a living, breathing, uh, separate human being. But putting that aside, that's, a, that's not even a, a, an opinion, that's just scientific fact. Now, suddenly those same people are saying, my body, your choice, you get to choose what goes in my body. Wow, what a difference a day makes, huh? Or 15 days to flatten the curve makes. So. This is creating a lot of cognitive dissonance. And, and to some degree, I'm actually heartened by this because what I've seen since January 1st here locally in LA and throughout the United States peripherally, because I talked to a lot of people in this, this, this area, is that those who are in that camp, who were in the camp of the mass delusional psychosis, fearful, compliant, follow the guru, give everything over on the altar of safety, and certainly saving the world because my life doesn't matter, you know, everyone else's lives do. Those people, they dutifully followed all the prompts. They got the shots, they distanced, they masked, they put on face shields, they wore gloves, they washed their hands, they stayed home, they kept their kids away from school. They let grandma suffer alone in a nursing home and you know, breathed her last breath 
uh, without seeing their family because they didn't want to put her at risk and she died anyway. They did all of that, all of it. And then in Christmas, Père Noël showed up and bestowed the coronavirus Omicron on every American. Everybody got sick. And in larger numbers, those who just received their booster shots, they got sick about 200% of the rate of everyone else. And now, after they got sick, and of course recovered, because nobody dies from this, it's a cold. After they recovered, they're now being told by their employer, by their university, by their school principal, that they can't go back to their place of work, study, location, whatever it is, without getting a second booster. I see patients every day now saying, I can't go back to college. It's all virtual right now. And I think they're going to return next week to real on-campus instruction. Uh, LA City Schools did, I think, on Monday this week. They can't go back unless they get a shot. And these are people who said, you know what? I'm done. I voted for, for President Brandon. I did everything he told me to do. I got the first shot and then I bled. I had menstrual bleeding for eight weeks that I couldn't control until I put in a hormonal IUD, finally staunched the bleeding. And then I got sick anyway. I was completely fine. I didn't die. I didn't even have a sniffle. And now I have natural immunity and they want me to get another shot that hurt me the first time and didn't protect me from getting sick. And the people who didn't get the shots, they got sick too. And they also recovered, i.e. the shots are basically just, uh, a talisman, except the talisman actually hurts me. It's full of arsenic and you want me to swallow it again. Screw you, I'm done. I'm not voting for you anymore. And I'm not going back to school and taking this shot. I'm getting an exemption. I'm gonna do online. I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna go somewhere else. These are not you know, right-wing Trump supporting racists. These are you know, uh, hippy dippy, uh, love the world, save the, save the whales and the cats. Uh, everyone deserves a check, pot smoking Biden supporters and they are done. This is Santa Monica in California, the Communist Republic of Santa Monica, and they are giving the middle finger to this. They are fed up. So I think this is positive because I think the cognitive dissonance is starting to break. As I wrote in my last Substack piece, I titled it Fantasy Versus Reality. The fantasy that they're being sold, all the lies about the safetyism and the compliance and the fear, all of that, that nonsense, and the reality, which is as I just described, which is everybody's going to get sick, everybody's going to be fine, shot or no shot, probably better if you don't get the shot. That reality and that fantasy, they're starting to diverge so, so rapidly with such a giant chasm that they can no longer uh, bridge the gap. They can't sew that and stitch that together every day, not even with 24 hours of CNN and MSNBC and New York Times and LA Times and, and Google ads and uh, Facebook pushes and Apple News. Even that isn't, isn't, isn't filling that gap for them anymore. And so they're starting to stand up and say, you know what, I think I'm done. I am just gonna live my life, I've had it. That's why I think things are gonna shift, at least in the United States in the next couple of months. I see this ending by Easter. I don't think this is gonna be sustainable because they're losing their base. Their, their, their robed, shaved headed acolytes are starting to leave the compound and they're moving back home. When people come out of the compound, and know their hair starts to grow back and they put the normal <laughs> clothes on. Like the doctors that have given these injections and given them to children. In, in the UK, they're trying to put them to five-year-olds. It, yeah. it makes me sick. Of course it does. They're experimental gene therapies. They're not, uh, they're I, not I know vaccines. that. They're not oh, vaccines. Yeah. Of course they're not. Yeah. How are these doctors going to, going to have to live with themselves knowing that they've done this? And there might be some real horrific consequences down the line. So some of them, who put masks on and gone about and done things that they have to live with that, but to live with something that you've done to another human being, especially a child, how are they going to live with themselves in that point? Because it's going to be like the end of like Nazi Germany when, when the um, brown shirts had to realize that actually, what have I done? What have I become? Well, to use the addiction analogy again, I think there's really only uh, two pathways, two options. One is they remain addicted. They live in denial they live a lie for the rest of their lives, just like some of those uh, Nazi experimenters who fled to Argentina and said, I did something that was helped my people and those Jews weren't even human. So who gives a crap about them? They continue to live that lie until they were arrested and eventually executed. That's one path. Um, that's the path of the addict that never accepts that he's addicted, never accepts that he's harming himself and others, continues to use despite harm and, and, and lot loses control um, and then winds up you know, circling the drain, eventually hitting rock bottom. And then as we all know, with every addict, it doesn't 
ultimately recover, he, he ends up dying. Um, that's one path. Uh, the other path is to actually acknowledge the truth uh, and to uh, acknowledge I did something horrible, uh, I'm responsible for it, and I need to make amends, and I need to seek apology, I need to seek contrition uh, from those that I've harmed. Um, those are, in my view, a, it's a black and white issue. I, I don't really think that there's a gray area. You, you either living in, you're living in truth and accountability or you're not. How that will pan out, I don't know. But that's why in my next book, I've, I've sort of outlined this, this program that I'm proposing as a national recovery plan. This is a recovery plan that is, that is national in scope. I don't mean national like, like it's coming from Washington. I mean national in scope and breadth. Should be international, really. But it's built up of individuals. The nation is built up of individuals. And a national recovery has to be built from individual people, individual citizens, individual physicians, teachers, teachers who have abdicated their responsibility to care for children, to be the custodian of our children. Teachers are, in my view, one of the most decimated, morally decimated professions that we have now in the United States. I have very little confidence, faith, or respect for most teachers today. And, and I think rightfully so. And I feel the same way about physicians, the same way about therapists. I, I would say rule of thumb, roughly speaking, about 80% of all physicians today are compromised in this country, in the United States. They have lost their moral authority, their ethical authority. Uh, they should no longer be allowed to practice medicine. Um, I would not give my body, the bodies of, of my, my loved ones to them because I don't trust them anymore. And it's not, it's not for me to fix that. Uh, it's up to them to accept that they've done something wrong and to, and to seek forgiveness and see if they can, uh, over a long period of time, uh, reestablish the trust that they've lost. And that is a big ask. And I understand that, but I'm not going to, to minimize it just for the sake of it being more palatable. We have lost a profession of teachers. We have lost a profession of, of physicians, uh, of, of therapists, um, not to mention, of course, the politicians and the media that, that have been corrupt for a very, very long time that nobody really cares about anyway, one way or another. This is very sad. It is a tragedy. Um, but just like the Tutsis and the, and the Hutus who massacred one another uh, in Rwanda uh, decades ago, the only way for that country to reestablish itself with any hope for a future was to have a reconciliation commission and for those who murdered the others to step forward and state what they had done and who they had killed. Uh, short of that, it was impossible, impossible to realign that country into one nation. So what you're talking about there, it all comes certain back to fear again. So these people are going to have to face the fear that they now have, not of a, of a, a mythical virus or a mythical issue out there the fear of what they've done so again it's they're going every step along the way people are going to have to face something they're scared of and do the right thing and the longer Absolutely. they put it off yeah. that is in a nutshell exactly what i'm saying this is a fear addiction and the first step of a program for recovering from that fear is to look in the mirror and to say i am an addict i am addicted to fear i have hurt myself and others and I want to move forward in a state of sobriety and recovery. That is so critical. That is foundational. If the fear were all taken away, the addiction were to disappear, let's just say magically, I could wave a wand, all fear addiction gone, we would be on the road to recovery right now. The only thing that's keeping us held back permanently, I mean, potentially permanently, is the maintenance of the fear, the maintenance of the fear that is fueled by media, large corporations and government, and by ourselves individually, our perpetuation of the fear, our continuing insistence on going back to feed our addiction of fear by going back to the dealer every day, by, by looking at our phone and getting the push notification, by watching CNN, by reading the news, swallowing it, injecting it into ourselves, and then getting that uh, temporary high, that relief that we feel as if we've injected a drug. Wow, it just feels so good to be recognized in my state of fear, I feel relaxed. And then a few hours later, they get antsy again, they need another hit. This is the problem that, that we are facing. It is a fear addiction, and it is just like any other drug. You need to break free of it, you need to find support groups, you need to face it, you need to overcome it, you need to acknowledge it, and you need to remain abstinent from it so that you can maintain a path of recovery. So when you spoke out and you started to talk about these things, you would initially faced fear in yourself. 
I mean, absolutely. Uh, and but you faced it straight away and did what was right face away. I mean, Robert Malone would have had it. Peter McCullum would have had it. Joe Rogan would have had it. I would have had yes. it. But we is the issue that we we went okay. We know this isn't a really popular thing to do, but it's the right thing to do. And down the line, we're we're going to save ourselves a lot of grief and pain further down well, the line. You're pointing out a basic therapeutic principle, which I've been pushing and stating and hammering away into my patients for the last 12 years, which is that we are not controlled by our feelings. Our feelings are transitory states. They're like waves of water sort of washing through us. We can be moved up and down and right and left by the feelings, but that shouldn't dictate where we swim, especially if it's going into a rocky shoal or being beached if we want to swim further out to sea or the opposite. We are in charge of our actions. The moment that we allow our feelings to dictate our actions, we're done, we're sunk. Because you can't control what feeling comes through you. No, longer, no more than you can control the wave of water that washes past you as you're floating in the ocean. The mistake that people have made recently, and I mean in the last 10, 15, 20 years, is that they have, they have elevated the role of their feelings above the role of their own rational mind, their own value system, and their own capacity for action. The moment that you tear that down and you say, I couldn't care less how I feel right now. I'm going to do what I believe to be right and what I have the capacity to do. I'm going to act not because of my fear. I'm going to act in spite of my fear. The moment you do that, now you've taken back your independence. You've taken back your own capacity, your own agency. And now nobody can control you. Nobody can dictate what you do and where you go by inculcating more fear, by injecting you with more paranoia. You could be shaking, your whole body could be shaking, but you'd still move forward because you know that's the direction you wanna go. This is so important for people to understand. This is a, a simple but incredibly important intellectual idea that is uh, at the basis of, of, of change, of growth, of development, of, of, of moving forward and evolving as a human being. And you, you ignore it at your peril. We've got about 10 minutes. This is fascinating and incredibly powerful. So you mentioned values there. Do you think the problem might be or be possibly that people are getting their values from outside of themselves, from the mainstream media, from social media, from other people? They're not actually thinking about things, looking at all of the information and picking their own morals and their own values. Their values are being given to them. And that well, virtue completely. signaling is an obvious form of that. Well, I've, the first third of my book, United States of Fear, I outline the cultural antecedents that are fear-driven, but also values-driven regarding and explaining why and how people became so susceptible to becoming hyper-emotional. One good example of that is the, the disappearance or, or dissolution or uh, a bleaching of the values that we used to hold towards the healthy expression of masculinity, being strong, being a leader, being... Um, powerful, uh, being assertive, uh, maintaining and containing hyper-emotionality, particularly in women, has been a masculine trait since the beginning of time. And yet in the last 30, 20, 10, certainly last five, six years, we have been taught and told, I would say indoctrinated, because it is a form of indoctrination, that masculinity is toxic. Anything that is masculine is toxic. Therefore, the way to be a good man and a good citizen and a good um, partner to a woman is to strip every part, every aspect of masculinity from you and to merge yourself into a sort of neutered state where you don't express any masculinity whatsoever. That is a value. That has become a value. That is not um, um, something inherent. That is something that has been taught to us. And that has led men to act as cowards, to walk around outdoors with masks on. And then that then is reflected back to women who see men as being scared, who can't fight off even an invisible virus, much less a, you know, an armed invasion. And that leads women to feel hysterical. And then they jump into the void and they try to, to, to produce and, and fill in the lack of courage and masculinity. And of course, that's not their role. So then they become overwhelmed. The whole system collapses, everything falls apart. That's just one value and it's a basic one. But think about all the others, about uh, how to recycle, uh, how to uh, treat gender norms, um, uh, racial uh, terms, and how to see uh, different colors of people and faces. Um, the idea of um, the value for, of making money as being something horrible and evil. You have to give your money to the state or you have to redistribute it. 
these are all values that have been that have been forced down our throats or subtly uh, inculcated into us through uh, government schools and, and corrupt universities. So now uh, people are, are, are not only hyper emotional because they don't understand that action is more important than feeling, they also have bad starting points in their head. They have a corrupt, I would call it a set of fantasy values that don't conform with reality, like the idea of communism. Communism is a fantasy. It's a sick one, uh, but it's a fantasy because it doesn't work. It never has. But if you believe that, if you value that, if you think communism and socialism are, are good things, if socialism is about being sociable, which is what young people in the US believe, it's about being sociable. That's a good thing. Then, then you really don't have the power of your mind to even harness, to take the correct action. You can't march in the right direction if you don't have the right map. If you're being given a map where north is south and south is north and east is west and west is east, and you're being told go east, you're gonna head the wrong way. There's no other way around that. And you're gonna head the wrong way in a state of emotional disrepair, which is the worst place to be. It seems the last question, I mean, it seems like that they've basically created chaos in the human mind. And we all know yes. the, the old axiom of order out of chaos. It's the order they're gonna give us from the chaos they've created in our heads. The last kind of point I wanna make, because I know you've got to go, is do you think self-worth has been replaced with the, with the term selfish and people are getting them confused? There's no the selfish and self-preservation has been repackaged of being selfish. It's absurd to me. Well, I have this problem with a lot of my patients. I had one earlier today who said, you know, I, I, I can't ask girls out. I feel afraid of dating. I feel um, unsuccessful at work. Uh, I'm not producing as much as I'd like. Uh, and I haven't exercised for a week. I'm just on my phone all day long. And I said, why are you not doing anything? And it was a challenge and, and, and also a kind of inquisitive you know, question. Why? I don't understand. You're young, you're healthy, you, you, you have a, a good family, you have a nice job, you're, you're, you're not ugly, you're, you're in good shape, you used to be a track star in high school. What, what's going on here? And he said to me something that I, I thought was really important. He said, I really struggle with doing anything for myself. He felt, because he's been taught this, that doing any of those things working, dating, exercising, was an act of selfishness. It was something immoral. It was something unvirtuous. That, that being a martyr, being miserable, being depressed is somehow in some way helping society. It's a good thing. Now, he, he wouldn't have said it that way. I'm putting words to it, but that was, that was technically kind of where, where it was, you know, if, if you put it at an emotional level. And so I think that that kind of idea, he's like in his late 20s, he's a young guy, that kind of idea of corruption of the, of the, 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 the drive to, to protect the self, uh, not out of fear, but to protect the self, to conserve the self so that one can then be more powerful and more uh, full of agency, uh, more independent so that one can then connect with others from a position of strength and clarity uh, and, and, and um, influence. That notion has now been redefined as selfish, as corrupt, as vain, as narcissistic. Once you have that, that, that perversion of language and idea in somebody's head, there is really no end to how you can control those people and how you can guide them like sheep. It's, it's truly frightening. And that's where we are today. I remember uh, a couple that I knew, they said, we've been together 40 plus years and um i was like are you happy I go no but we stuck at it i was like but you've been miserable for 40 years what's the fucking point it just maybe it didn't make any sense to me you've just wasted 40 years but they well, were just adamant not I, i've been able to put up with that much misery aren't i good it was just odd to me i hear it in my practice we're miserable we hate each other we're depressed uh why are you still married it's been 25 years it's for the children <laughs> We yeah. don't want to get divorced till the children turn 18. And you think that children are happy living with two miserable parents? Are you kidding me? What have you been smoking? I know. I grew up so in that foolish. situation myself. <laughs> so guys, please head out and get Mark's book, this fantastic book, United States of Fear. It's a great read and it's a quick read. I've been reading it on the way to Derby when I've been doing my other work. So also, Mark, before you go, tell us about your new book and where people can find you and, contact, and get in contact with you. Sure. So I'm writing it right now. I hope to have it out by Easter. It's going to be... Um, Freedom from Fear, Moving Forward, an individual and national 12-step program to recovery from the fear addiction. Uh, it will also be available on Amazon. Uh, and what I'm doing right now to help consolidate information about what I, what I write is uh, I created a website called Dissident MD. 
And on Dissident MD, you can uh, click on a link to purchase my current book, which is United States of Fear, as well as look at my posts on Facebook or Twitter. And then you can also click there to go to my Substack account, where I write uh, a short essay on a, a, a burning issue that I think is important in the intersection of, um, of psychology, psychiatry, politics, and, and healthcare uh, every, every morning on Thursday. Uh, and that's also called Dissident MD, the Substack account, but you can click through it from the website. The only other site that I would recommend people go to, uh, if you want to see things about like videos, podcasts, uh, interviews I've done, um, is my uh, podcasting site, where I work with Dr. Jeff Barkey, who's a family practice physician. We interview people and guests from around the world, Australia, uh, Great Britain, uh, Canada, uh, all kinds of people about this, this burning topic of the day of uh, fear and the pandemic. And it's called Informed Dissent. The intersection of healthcare and politics. And informed dissent is available on all podcasting sites, but our website has all the you know, nice clips and interviews of, of, of our speeches, and that's called informeddissentmedia.com. So I advise everyone and, and urge everyone to, to go to informed dissent or informed, I'm sorry, dissident MD, my, my literary website, or informeddissentmedia.com. Okay, guys, I will put all those links below and we'd love to get you on the Right Now show, our main flagship show in the studio. And once you've been on that one, which is a 15 minute interview, I do another show in the big, in the big studio in Derby and I'd love to do another hour long interview in there or it goes out to a, quite a really big audience. But thank you so much for your time. I know you're busy. It's been a, an absolute pleasure to talk to you and I really appreciate your time. And I'll put all the links thank below. You. Guys, please take care. Goodbye. I'm unapologetically fly. No wonder why, that's just my attitude. Yeah. Okay, hey, that's just my uh, 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 Come on Yeah, yeah, uh.